Welcome to Incredible Idaho. I'm Wayne Walker. Tonight we begin our show by flying over south central Idaho in search of mule deer. Now each winter the Idaho Department of Fish and Game conducts big game counts to determine how well our wildlife populations have fared over the last year. And if the mule deer numbers south of Twin Falls are any indication, 1995 is looking good. On this uh, sugar loaf and dry creek winter ranges, deer numbers are up about 30% over last year, which is quite encouraging because uh, the, the severe winter of 92-93 generally reduced these deer populations by about 30% in this area. So the numbers that we've seen on this uh, flight the last couple of days suggest to us that uh, populations have rebounded and recovered quite well. It certainly looks like it from here. A vast herd of mule deer races across the plateau slightly ahead of our helicopter, which brings up the obvious question. How do biologists actually count individual animals when confronted with groups this large? I got 88. I got 83. And typically there's two observers plus the pilot on board, so all three people can be counting and you can compare notes and see just how, how close you are. Um, and typically you can come within three or four animals if you're into a group of uh, 200. Typically all three observers will count pretty close. Of course, some experience helps and a tendency not to get airsick. But the technique is quite simple. The biologists actually enumerate each animal they see. Now try testing yourself. How many deer do you see in this picture? We'll even make it a bit easier and freeze the shot. Here's what wildlife biologist Randy Smith and pilot Brent Wood came up with. 59, I got 58. That's very close. How did you do? Randy says it's generally easier to count deer against a white backdrop, but despite the lack of snow cover, this year's early spring weather has actually worked to their advantage because it tends to concentrate the animals along a narrow strip of green up. Okay, looking for another group? Yeah. If a herd is too large to count in a pass, the helicopter pilot simply splinters off a portion by maneuvering between them. If you hear that might be one group we need to uh, split some off, count everything on the right. Uh, the one nice thing about mule deer is you don't often count them in trees like you might with elk and other things. Uh, our winter ranges here are primarily fairly open country and uh, they're not that difficult to, to count. But what about those other situations? How do you count elk concealed in the thick stands of pine winding along the Locksaw River, or bighorn sheep hidden among the rocks in the canyons of the Oahe Desert Country? How do scientists estimate population numbers where actual animals are difficult to see? In recent years, a significant tool has been created in wildlife biology to address this problem. It's called a citability model. A few years ago on Incredible Idaho, we brought you a story on how such a tool was developed to estimate the number of California bighorns that live in the Owyhee Desert. The dun-colored coats of the wild sheep easily blend with the muted hues of the desert environment they inhabit, making it difficult to spot them from the air. Once again, you're the wildlife biologist. How many sheep do you see in this picture? Now, even as we close in, until they move, the bighorns are almost impossible to detect. The idea behind the sightability model is to compensate for sheep the observers cannot see from the helicopter. Of course, that can depend on the type of terrain, the density of the vegetation, and the activity of the animals. All these factors must be accounted for when developing the sightability model. We put observers out on these various points out here, and then they have sheep in sight. We come flying through in a helicopter like we were doing a standard census, and we have the observers on the ground tell us whether or not we saw the sheep. One of the ground observers is research biologist John DeRamus from the Bureau of Land Management. The idea is for me to watch the sheep so that when the helicopter comes by, we'll have an idea of how many they see or don't see of the ones that I am watching. After five years of this kind of data collection, a computer model has been developed 
on the Owyhee Bighorns by the Idaho Department of Fish and Game in cooperation with the Bureau of Land Management and the University of Idaho. They found that in canyon country like this, the helicopter crew detects 67% of the moving sheep. Of the bighorns that are standing still, only 33% are seen from the sky. But up on the flats, visibility increases dramatically. Here, 70% of stationary animals and 91% of the moving sheep are seen by the helicopter crew. Okay, I got two rams down here in the rim rock, uh, the group number 34. Overall, according to this study, the aerial survey spots 66% of the sheep that are within sight of the ground observers. Equipped with this kind of information, wildlife biologists can plug the actual numbers from the aerial surveys into this computer model and come up with a more accurate population census on the Owyhee bighorns. This results in better management decisions that ultimately affect Idaho sportsmen. A similar sort of computer model has already been developed for aerial surveys on Idaho's elk population. And by this time next year, Randy Smith will be using a new sightability model developed specifically for mule deer. Um, in the past, we would fly, and the one big question that remained at the end of the survey was, what percentage of the deer population did we actually count? And we never had a good way of knowing how many deer we missed and how many deer we counted. Now, when the biologists fly mule deer surveys, along with animal numbers, they also record several other factors, such as the vegetation type, the percentage of the area that's covered with vegetation or snow, and the activity of the deer. We found that if we record those variables for each group of deer that we see, that uh, a computer model will help correct for uh, the actual numbers of deer out there. So for the first time, we're actually um, estimating deer populations with a known level of precision. Reliable information like this is the key to good management for our state's wildlife resource. Basically, we try and flush the birds into the net and hope you have enough of a backdrop where the net is almost invisible to them. Our next story is about a research project that, for some strange reason, brings to mind baseball metaphors. We'll tell you about that later. But first, we'll explain the science behind the research, then stay tuned for Fish and Game's answer to the baseball strike, the strange new sport of fielding a pheasant. Since 1903, when the ringneck pheasant was officially introduced into our state, it is rated as one of Idaho's most popular game birds. For years, these birds thrived in our farmlands, but over the last few decades, the pheasant population has sharply declined. It's true populations are lower than what they have been, say, during the 50s or 60s, but farming practices have changed greatly, and the quality and the type of habitat have also changed. Other things with occurring within the uh, pheasant's habitat may have, uh, have changed over the years, too. Uh, for instance, the, the uh, amounts and kinds of predators may have changed, the types of pesticides used by farming operations may have changed, as well as just uh, harvesting practices. The question then becomes, to what extent have these changes impacted the pheasant population? Is the problem an increase in foxes and feral cats that prey on the birds, or is improving the habitat, allowing for protection from cold and predators the solution? Could it be a combination of these factors? The answers may soon be found in an intensive new study that has just been launched in the Magic Valley by the Idaho Department of Fish and Game in cooperation with the University of Idaho, Pheasants Forever, and local landowners. The premise is simple. Divide the project area into segments. Some segments will have no changes. These are the control groups. A couple of the areas will have the predators removed, and other sections will be managed for habitat improvement. Then it just becomes a matter of time to see where the pheasant population declines and where it thrives. But of course, the key is to first capture the birds in each segment, to mark them with radio so biologists can measure their survival and nesting success. And that means, yeah, you guessed it, play ball. Butch Morris is a landowner who has graciously agreed to provide our field of dreams. 
I like seeing the birds out here. I like cooperating with the fish and game, you know, with, with their project here. And, you know, if they increase the numbers, that's, that's great with me. A true fan of the sport. The anticipation mounts as the ground crew marches behind the plate to set up the backstop. It's quite an extensive one that biologists call a mist net. Basically, we try and flush the birds into the net and hope you have enough of a backdrop where the net is almost invisible to them. And with any luck, snare a couple of hens and put some radio transmitters on them so we can follow them around this summer. The home team takes the field. The rookie, Gary Norenberg, takes right, and veteran Jack Conley goes to short. This is it. Batter up. Butch climbs onto the pitcher's mound and explains his strategy. What I'm going to try to do is maybe do this side first, and whatever's there might flush them out into this and then. Butch checks his fielders. He motions Gary to the left. He's into the windup, delivers, looks like a slider. The combine comes down low and inside. Nope, ball one. Now Butch will probably go to his fastball now. He's in his stretch. He lets the combine go, and the pheasant swings. Out of play. It's a foul into the cheap seats. Yeah, they flew really high. Um, they saw the, <clears throat> the nets billowing in the wind like a sail. And so it goes with long innings that appear pretty boring to the uneducated fan. But if you have an appreciation for the nuances of the sport, you'll find yourself engrossed in the tactics of each team. Butch is ready again, bringing the combine down hard and fast. The pheasant swings and lofts a fly ball to right field. Gary races in and he snags it. She's out of there. What a catch. Young Nornberg won't forget this one. We got two on that one. The second pheasant caught trying to steal third. Holy cow, now let's go down to the dugout where our team is fitting the pheasant with a necklace supporting a lightweight radio transmitter. And they're also equipped with what's called a mortality sensor. So if the bird does not move or this transmitter doesn't move for six hours, it sets off a different signal so we can tell that the bird has probably been killed. We can locate it right away and try and determine what killed it. Next, the bird is equipped with a leg band, and then she's weighed. These numbers are recorded along with the rest of her stats. Then she's out of the dugout and takes the go. field. All right, little lady, go ahead. You're out of here. Very nice. Some folks have suggested releasing game farm birds to help boost pheasant populations. Now, in keeping with our baseball analogy, we'll call them replacement players. But research in other areas has indicated these substitutes add nothing to the wild stock, often not even making it through one inning. The pheasants that we raise in captivity, for the most part, uh, have very, very low survival rates in the wild. Sometimes they only last a day or two after we release them during the fall. The game farm birds are unaware of predators and accustomed to being fed by humans, and it's a different ball game in the majors. This is not a real good management technique, and that its, it, it's only real value is in enhancing hunting opportunity over a fairly short period of time. What is the best management technique for restoring pheasant populations? Well, that's what this research game is all about. The final score is a few years off, but in the meantime, let's enjoy the game. Batter up. Here's the pitch. The swing, it's popped up high in the infield. Looks like both Jack and Dave have a shot at it. Oh, nice. Yes. Yes. Whoa, near collision. And it's second baseman Dave Musel coming up with the bird. That ring neck is out of there. Yeah, the wily old ring neck wasn't so wily this afternoon, was he? There are certain injuries if they, they really must be treated within a very specific time frame. Chest trauma, some head injuries we'll be talking about later. On a beautiful spring day, unlike this one, most of us find ourselves itching to put on our hiking boots and explore Idaho's outdoors. But are we properly prepared if something goes wrong? In our next story, emergency medical technician Liz Meyer gives us some basic lessons in wilderness first aid. There are certain injuries if they, they really must be treated within a very specific time frame. 
Liz Meyer has combined her medical skills and her love of the outdoors into a job that takes her all over the country to teach classes like this. She works for an organization out of New Hampshire called Stone Hearth Open Learning Opportunities, or SOLO, that specializes in training folks from outward bound instructors to weekend hikers in advanced first aid techniques. This month, she's landed at Boise State University's Outdoor Adventure Program, and although the course is taught here inside, the real classroom is out here. Okay, I got the first aid kit, so I'll make sure that goes in there. Taking a class like this gives you a lot more respect and fear for what is out there. A lot of people, they don't do it because they're consciously rebelling against, you know, the rules of the wilderness. It's just because they don't know. And this way, by educating more people, these people will tell their friends, and when they go out hiking with their friends, then, you know, it gets passed on. So you get more and more intelligent hikers, and, and that means more safety in the woods for everyone. Liz says the most common hiking injury is probably a sprained ankle. So we asked the director of the Outdoor Adventure Program, Kelly Rogers, to simulate a painful sprain. Before treating Kelly, Liz rules out a spinal injury and then moves him off the slippery rocks to an area that's safer for both Liz right and her patient. Get some stuff for you to sit on. The next thing you go down, you, what we call the A, B, C, D, E's. D is disability. I already did airway breathing circulation. Disability is major back. I already ruled out the back and head injury. And E is for expose or environment. Since he's sitting on the cold ground and we might be here for a while, I want to make sure he doesn't lose any body heat and get hypothermic. So I'm going to ask him to help me get the thermorest under him. Next, Liz gently removes Kelly's boot. Some people say you want to leave the boot on to offer the rigidity since you're going to have to walk out. But if it's a really bad sprain, it's going to swell up really bad. You're not going to get the boot off and it's going to act as a tourniquet and he's not going to get any more circulation into his feet. Liz assesses the injury checking the swelling and discoloration, and then pushing down on the toenail. If it turns pink again as she releases, his circulation is okay. The next step is to splint the ankle, immobilizing the bones above and below the injured joint. I want to hyperextend it. So is that comfortable for you there, Kelly? Okay. So when you're making a splint, you can use anything rigid or bulky around. What I'm going to use is Kelly's jacket. And uh, you just have to learn to kind of make do with what you've brought with you because when you're in the woods, you're not always super prepared. Can you let me know if there's any tingling in your toes? So that's bad. Liz notices that Kelly seems chilled and has him put on her jacket and a wool hat she's packed along. I don't want you to get hypothermic on me while I'm treating your sprain. Liz emphasizes that packing along simple, lightweight things such as a bandana and an extra wool hat can be the key to whether an unfortunate experience becomes a minor discomfort that you can deal with or a real struggle for both you and your patient. Side. Just go ahead. You can put a little weight on it, but not as much. Just put as much weight on me as you have to. Okay, of course, one of the most okay. important things to pack along is a first aid kit. Okay, well this is one of the commercial kits that you can buy at any of the outdoor shops we have here in town. And this is basically the best one they have to offer because I wanted to be able to show you that ideally this is everything you should have, especially when you're taking out a larger group of people. And you don't know exactly the medical history of everybody and you kind of have to consider everything. Liz packs liquid glucose for diabetics, a snake bite kit that contains a razor and suction device to keep the venom from spreading and your standard aspirin, sunscreen, and the like. One of the things it has is a space for what they call an EpiPen, which is um, a, a shot of epinephrine, which is a synthetic adrenaline for people who have severe reactions to bee stings. If you don't have one of these around and somebody has an anaphylactic shock reaction to a bee sting, their airway completely closes and there's nothing you can do. Safety matches, bandages, and gauze wrap round out the package and one other critical item to guarantee your own safety. Most importantly, this has a pair of latex gloves because you always have to take your health care into responsibility first. You always want to make sure that you and the others are safe. So if there's any blood or any body fluids around, you want to make sure you've got your latex gloves. So the bottom line, be prepared and think ahead and you'll have a great outdoor adventure.
You may recall a story we did a couple of years ago on Incredible Idaho with outdoorsman Steve Silva and his three Swiss Alpine pack goats. Come on guys, let's show those llamas where you can go. These are goats specially bred to be pack animals and when full grown can carry up to 60 pounds of gear. Well, those goats so impressed our incredible Idaho photographer Tom Hazor that he invested in two young goats himself. Let's go, boys. Tom has high hopes that someday his boys, as he calls them, will bear the weight of our camera, tripod, and batteries on some of our more strenuous shoots. We'll keep you updated on their progress. But first, as we close our show tonight, let us introduce you to the boys. They're not quite ready for prime time yet, but they sure have taken to Idaho's outdoors.